Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Did you tell somebody about Jesus this week? All right. Well, maybe next week. Okay. Um, we had the opportunity on a couple of occasions and uh, we, we met yesterday for a preliminary meeting regarding a trip to Honduras that uh, I'm going on. I'm very excited. It'll be my very first mission trip. Wow. So, That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So we're going to Honduras to tell folks about Jesus. It's a medical mission uh, mission trip, and I'm, I'm an assistant. Is Miss Terry going? No, she's Is not she going. Is she excited about you going? No, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she's tolerating it. Now, now the, the trip to Botswana that I wanted to do in yeah. August, that one may not be in the cards. But, um, uh, but anyway, we're, we're, we're going to Honduras uh, in July. Okay, so uh, how about reading your Bible through? On time, uh, read your Bible through. Uh, all right. And uh, in our reading this week, we came across the answers to these three trivia questions. Um, King Hezekiah of Judah called on the Lord to deliver him from the Assyrians who were besieging the city of Jerusalem. One angel delivered them. Uh, what did that angel do and how did he deliver uh, Jerusalem? He killed a bunch of soldiers, 185,000 Assyrian mm -hmm. soldiers. One angel killed in one night. Um, and so they were, uh, they were delivered. Then uh, Hezekiah got sick and he was told that he was going to die, but he prayed. Uh, and the Lord heard his prayer and gave him a specific number of additional years. How many years did God give Hezekiah of additional life? Fifteen. Absolutely. Good job. Uh, in the New Testament, immediately following Jesus' announcement that he would be betrayed by someone in the very room with them, they somewhat dismissed that idea and began, began arguing among themselves about something else. In that solemn moment, uh, what were they bickering about? Do you remember? Uh, it was about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Uh, pretty indicative of, of where our priorities <laughs> lie, you know. Uh, it's uh, uh, what's in it for me kind of thing. Uh, so we're in, we're, we're, we're continuing our journey through the book of John. We have been uh, uh, up through the, the 12th chapter of John. We were looking at the first 33 years of Jesus' life. And now from uh, here, verse chapter 13 through the end of the book, almost through the end of the book, we're going to be looking at mere hours. So this, the setting for, for this is, it's Thursday night of Passion Week. It is the eve of the Passover, and the city of Jerusalem is packed with as many as two million people that have come into the city to celebrate the Passover. You remember the Passover uh, reminds them of the time in Egypt when uh, God was preparing to deliver them and he was sending plagues on the Egyptians. The last plague was the death angel was coming to take the firstborn. So they followed God's prescription of, of uh, killing the Passover lamb taking some of the blood and putting it on the lintels and the head post of a uh, doorpost, doorpost and lintel uh, of their door. And when the death angel saw the blood, he would pass over that house. And so uh, the prophet uh, Daniel has prophesied the very year that Messiah is going to be cut off. And this is the year. So Jesus has orchestrated all of the events of uh, the last few years to culminate in 
a designed death that's going to occur and he's going to be sacrificed as the real Passover lamb while all of the other lambs are being slaughtered for the Passover meal. So those two events are happening concurrently on Friday afternoon or, or Friday. But here it is, it's still Thursday night. And in, in verse, uh, we're gonna be looking at verses 31 through the end of the chapter. But in verse 30, Jesus dismisses Judas. And it says that Judas went out and it was night. Judas went out into the night and he never saw the light of day. And uh, uh, because he, he went out and he killed himself, hung himself. And verse 13, or chapter 31, chapter 13, verse 31 says, uh, and let's read the, the text today. Uh, somebody read for us verses 31 through 35. 31 through 35, chapter 13. Gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then 36 through the end of the chapter. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. There are some marks of uh, a true follower of Jesus. But before we get to those, I, I want to um, point out here in this text, this is, these are, between now and the end of, of uh, the book of John, these are some of the most poignant passages in all of the scripture that uh, as, as Jesus is teaching his guys, uh, and, and, and think about the import of this. It's just moments before he's taken away by the, the mob that Judas is leading and subjected to uh, cruel torture and, and a death on the cross. And in these moments, he's conveying to his disciples some of the most important concepts in the uh, relationship of God to his people that the world would ever hear. And it starts in verse 31, as soon as Judas left the room. Think about that. Here's the traitor. This, this guy, uh, Satan himself, has taken up residence in the body of Judas. Hmm. Uh, uh, he has... Uh, he didn't delegate this to his head demon. He didn't delegate it to any of his lower ranked demons. Uh, I guess the old saying is, if you want a job done right, you do it yourself. So Satan himself uh, possessed Judas. And the, the presence of the enemy of God was in that room mm -hmm. until Jesus dismissed him and said, go and do what you're doing and do it quickly. Um, uh, Judas occupied, possessed by the uh, uh, devil himself, went to do the bidding of God. He had to do what he had to do in these moments in order for Jesus to make it to the cross to be glorified in saving us. So as soon as Jude, Judas left the room, the presence of evil left the room. And this is one of the things that happens when Jesus comes. 
When Jesus comes, we may be in the middle of darkness. We may be in desperate conditions. We might be uh, in, in, in a very dark place. But when Jesus comes, he'll send the opponent away. And in these moments, in the absence of the presence of the enemy, uh, Jesus begins to instruct his guys. The first thing he says is, the time has come. Uh, remember at the very first uh, miracle that Jesus did, uh, which was what? What was the very first miracle that Jesus did that's recorded? He turned water into wine. He turned water into wine. Uh, when Mary had come to Jesus and said, they have no wine, the first thing he said was, my time has not come. But he went ahead and, and did the miracle that was needed. But over and over again, you'll hear Jesus say, throughout his ministry, my time has not yet come. Well, here he's changing. He says, the time has come. Uh, he said just a few verses earlier when Philip brought the Gentiles to him, he says, for the very first time, my time has come. My time has now come. So what, what is that time that has come? It's his time to do what he came to this earth to do, to be lifted up. And what did he say? If, if, if I be lifted up, I'm going to do what? I'll draw all men unto me. So he said, that's about to happen. And he knows that's about to happen. He knows that it's going to be difficult. It's going to hurt. It's going to be awful. But it is a part of the plan that allows God the Father to be glorified, for him to be glorified, and for him to complete the task that he came to complete. So he says, the time has come for the Son of Man, or remember that term came out of Daniel, uh, where uh, uh, Daniel uses that term to refer to the Messiah who is coming. Uh, it's time for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. <clears throat> and in, in His prayer a little later, you'll hear Him pray, Lord, glorify Your Son with the glory that I had before the world was made. Um, so He's about to enter into that glory. And it, it's hard to imagine from our human perspective to think that the cross was glorious, that the, the, the torture, the process uh, that he went through hanging there on that cross and dying that terrible uh, death, but before dying, the wrath of God poured out on him and an infinite amount of wrath because of infinite number of sins that we would all have committed past, present, future he paid the price for those in those moments on the cross and it took an infinite God to absorb that. So that is the glory of the cross. Um, so he's entering into his glory and then here's the other thing, that his obedience here is glorifying the Father and it's time for God will be glorified because of him. Because of him who? The Son of Man. Uh, Jesus himself. He's speaking of himself in third person. So God the Father's going to be glorified. Verse 32. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. It's happening. It has already begun. God is being glorified in the, the life of Jesus and the Father is glorifying Jesus. And there are very few places on the planet that don't know about the glory of what Jesus did on the cross. Those places do still exist. Uh, uh, Austin Till was here in our Sunday school class was talking about an encounter that he had uh, at, in, at a university in China where he said 
that a crowd had gathered around him, this obvious non-Chinese guy uh, was there on campus and, and they were there talking with him and, and one guy pushes his way to the front and introduces himself and, and uh, asks him what he's doing there. And, and the first question Austin asked him was, um, what, do you, what do you think about Jesus? And the guy says, what is, what is, what is a Jesus? He had not heard. There's still places on the planet where people have not heard. And that's one of the reasons that God sends people out to tell them about Jesus and the glory of what he has done for us and the path forward that we can have out of our dark place into the light. Um, verse 33. Uh, verse 32 ends with Jesus saying he's going to do it at once, mere minutes away, just a few hours, and it will, it, it's already in play, it's in motion now, and he says it's going to happen at once, and he says, dear children, listen to that, you, you, you can hear the pathos in, in those words as he's speaking to his disciples, uh, and he understands that as far as uh, who he is and who they are, they're mere children in the faith. They're mere children in their walk uh, in this new life. They're, they're mere children. Uh, but that's, that can be a compliment too. Because Jesus did say at an earlier time, except you become as little children, you'll in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. So here he's addressing them, little children, dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. Now this, it, it doesn't matter who you are. If you love somebody and you know that they are about to leave this world, it's a painful moment. And it's a moment that you're, you're, everything in you screams, no, no, don't leave. Uh, and, and that has to be what was going on with these guys because they're looking at this healthy Jewish man who appears to be in control of everything. They've seen him stop the wind. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him heal the leper. They've seen him heal the blind and the lame. They've seen him raise the dead. Here is God in flesh, and they know it, and here he's saying, I'm going away. I'm going to not be with you much longer. Um, but then he does tell them later on over in Acts that it's, it's imperative that I go away for the comforter cannot come unless I do go away. But he said, I will be with you only a little longer. Hours it is, in fact. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. Where is he going? Hmm? Where is he going? He's going to the cross. And nobody can pay for their own sins. Nobody can go to a cross and pay for their own sins and atone for their own sins. Where he's going, nobody else can go. No, no sinner, no saint. Nobody can go to the cross but him. He's going alone. And he's going there to atone for our sins. And, and then beyond that, He's going on to be with the Father. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you'll search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. When are they going to search for him? Well, I can imagine when the, when the Roman soldiers came to, to the Jewish leaders and said, uh, guys, the, the tomb is empty. The, you know, the tomb we were guarding. Uh, it's, it's, it, you're not going to believe this, but there were... Uh, angels and you know it's, 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 it, we don't know what happened and they, they may have sent a search party to look he says but you, they will, you will search for me but you can't come where I'm going now this is also a warning I think if, if you look at it and look at the context of how it unfolded 
uh, he's telling his guys, don't try to follow me where I'm going. In these next moments, I want to protect you. So don't go where I'm going. But Peter and John did, remember? You know, John was there at the cross uh, and, and Jesus said, uh, uh, son, behold your mother, uh, woman, behold your son. And John was there at the cross. He's the only one that's identified as being at the cross. Uh, Peter, we know, was uh, there at the, uh, at the trial at Caiaphas' house in the courtyard around the fire. Um, and I think you could infer from this that Jesus said, don't, don't, don't follow me. For your sake, don't follow me. And, and uh, we, we, we've seen it in the garden when he's being arrested. Some of the saddest words in the Bible says that they all forsook him and fled. Um, now, here he says, you can't come where I'm going. He's going to the cross. He's going through this ugly trial and abuse and then to the cross. Um, he says, you can't come where I'm going. So, now I'm giving you a new commandment. A new commandment that you love each other. Now, why is that new? Over in the Old Testament, we have time after time after time where we're told uh, that we all love, love one another and love each other. But the culture had evolved to the place that it was so legalistic. There was no love in it. There was no love in the Jewish religion. It was all about do this, don't do that. Don't do this and don't do that. Um, so there was no love in the Jewish culture. Um, uh, as men who were married treated their, their wives like property. Uh, their children like property. There was no, there was no love uh, uh, exhibited. But here he says, I give you a new commandment. Now this, this is, if there is one thing that identifies the Christian today, it has to be, we love each other. We, we, we are family together. We're forever family. And we love each other. He says, now I'm giving you a new commandment. And that commandment is love each other. Now before, when one of the Pharisees was testing him, he says, Master, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him and said, thou, and he goes back to the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, and he says, uh, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And here he's saying, I'm, I'm giving you a new commandment. He's, whoa, you can think about this. He said, no, wait a minute. It's not new. We heard you say that before, that we've got to love one another. And I think there was a newness in the urgency here. There was a newness in the setting that he's moments away from the cross. And this is a, this is a new commandment in the sense that there's a new emphasis on it that um, uh, that you love each other. And he, he goes on to say in, in one version, it says, they will know you because of your love for the brethren. He says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If there is any one thing that will carry the day as far as a message to the lost world, it's a message of love. And we have to learn how to love people unconditionally. Uh, God is delivering me from being a judgmental twit, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that and trying to learn how to love people just the way they are, just how they are, behaving the way they behave, uh, and without, without judgment. Uh, 
That doesn't mean I agree with bad behavior. It just means that I'm, t I'm trying to take this seriously, that it all starts with love. And, and I tell people, there, there, there are a lot of folks, this lifestyle, that sexual orientation, this, this uh, a radical belief, throw it out the window. Just learn to love people. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to be able to reach people that we disagree with unless they know that we love them. Once people know that we genuinely care about them, then they will lend us their ear mm -hmm. to listen to our message. But if we castigate people, if we push people aside, if we, if we yell at folks, you're, you're doing wrong, you're living wrong, they're not going to want to hear. They've heard enough of that. Mm -hmm. They've heard a lot of that from church folk, okay? Um, what they haven't heard is, I love you just the way you are, just who you are, who you're with, how you're behaving. I love you just the way you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, isn't that the way God loves us? Mm -hmm. Just the way we are. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Mm -hmm. So you would think that after this discourse on love here, these very poignant words, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. You would think the next question from the crowd would be, why is that new? Help me understand. Uh, uh, and what do you mean by loving one another? Can you, can you explain that a little better for us and help us illustrate it and so forth? It, but that's not what happened. I, I think they didn't hear that because Jesus said, I'm going away. You, you, know, you know how it is. You'll hear something that grabs your attention and then your, your mind starts working on that and then you miss everything that comes after that. Um, and I think that's what happened here with Peter. Uh, Peter asked, Lord, what, what, where are you going? And he said, you can't go with me. He says, where are you going? And Jesus said, you can't go with me now, but you will follow later. You will follow later. Can't come out. Where's he going? He's going to the cross. And he says, Peter, you're going to go to your own cross. Tradition tells us that Peter was crucified on a cross. But he requested and they agreed with him that he wasn't worthy to be crucified like Jesus. So he asked to be crucified upside down. Um, yeah. Um, so, but Jesus said, you will follow me later. And he did because he went to a cross, not for the same reasons. Uh, Jesus went to the cross to absorb the wrath of God for all the sins of the world but Peter went to the cross because of his witness because uh, he was telling people about Jesus uh, but why G uh, uh, Peter says why four year olds you hear over here why <laughs> why it's, it, it, is a, it, it is a cry from our hearts to want to know from childhood we want to know Inquiring minds want to know. And so Peter said, but why? Why can't I come now, uh, Lord? And he does call him Lord. And then Peter goes on to say, and he's already demonstrated he's ready to pull out a sword for Jesus. Well, he hadn't done it yet because they're not in the garden yet. But he'll demonstrate a little later that he's ready to die with Jesus as he pulls out a sword later. Um, uh, he says, I'm ready to die for you. I'm ready to die for you. How many of you know that it's easier to die for Jesus than it is to live for him? Peter demonstrated that to us as he pulls out the sword later there in the garden and begins whacking away and cuts off Malchus's ear. Um, 
And yet, when he's confronted with a little servant girl that uh, uh, exposes him as one of Jesus' disciples, he becomes the coward in those moments. So, um, die for me? Jesus answered, die for me? I'll tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times that you even know me. One of the traits of a true believer is that we're not perfect. Peter was a true believer. He was. But he was also human with human fears before the Holy Spirit grabbed him on the day of Pentecost and changed him and radically changed him. Um, just to wrap up, oh, I need to. Um, just to wrap up, uh, we, we have a love and out of that love comes uh, a love for God's glory. We want to make sure that Jesus is lifted up and God is glorified. We, we want to demonstrate our love for our brothers and sisters and their well-being. Uh, and we want to uh, love the Lord by loving his work and investing our lives in the work of the Lord. So... We go where Jesus goes, ultimately, uh, and that is uh, to a world uh, of love. Mm -hmm. Our world is a world of love, loving each other, loving the glory of God, loving our brothers and sisters, and loving the work. Mm -hmm. Let's be focused on that and let go of our judgment toward folks that are not like us. Mm -hmm. And... Try to demonstrate to them that we love them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. We are so very grateful. Bless our time together in worship. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'd pour out your spirit in this place and may souls be saved mm -hmm. and saints be encouraged and love abound. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.